Welcome to Dr. English and my reading of uh, George Orwell's famous novel Animal Farm. I'm going to start with chapter one and read it for you. I'm just assuming that you've watched my other videos, especially the one on Animal Farm being an allegory for the Russian Revolution. Okay, let's get going. Um, before we do though, could I ask that you like and subscribe to Dr. English, my channel, so that you can keep in touch and hear um, about new videos coming up. I promise I won't spam you. It'd be great if you would subscribe. Also, you'll hear the sound of a fly, which is on uh, pops up here and there in the recording, and I apologize for that, but it would take me forever to re-record all of that without the fly, so just, um, just um, my apologies. You'll have to put up with it. Okay, let's get going. All right, chapter one. Mr. Jones of the manor farm had locked the hen houses for the night but was too drunk to remember to shut the potholes. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery and made his way up to bed where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. Okay, so the first thing to pick up here, and I've highlighted, you'll see my highlights, uh, quotes that I've highlighted as I've gone along. This idea of Mr. Jones being too drunk is meant to connect up with the idea that the Russian monarchy, Nicholas, the Russian Tsar, was kind of had lost touch with how to be a good leader and that uh, they were kind of decadent and not really doing a very good job and paying attention to how best govern their society. So Mr. Jones is a poor leader and his being a poor leader means, you know, the neglect of his people, animals in his farm, it leaves the door open to rebellion. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out, there was a stirring and a fluttering all through the farm buildings. Word had gone around during the day that old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a strange dream on the previous night and wished to communicate it to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big barn as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. I've just highlighted here a couple of other names for old Major because you may wish in your essay writing to use them or refer to them in order to show your knowledge of, of the text. I've highlighted a strange dream here because I think Old Major is meant to represent figures like Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, people who who dream of a change rather than, you know, he dies before he can live through or, or put into place the changes, the revolutionary changes that he's dreaming about. But we have Karl Marx who's from the 1840s onwards comes up with a dream or a vision for how the world could be a better place. And Old Major is kind of meant to represent that idea. So he was always called, though the name under which he had been exhibited was Willingdon Beauty, was so highly regarded on the farm that everyone was quite ready to lose an hour's sleep in order to hear what he had to say. So I've highlighted Willingdon Beauty there as another reference to uh, old Major, and also just the fact that he was highly regarded. I've highlighted that because if at some stage we wish to discuss Old Major, these are the kinds of quotes that we can use to talk about him that he's highly regarded and highly thought of, and therefore influential on the farm. At one end of the big barn, on a sort of raised platform, Major was already ensconced on his bed of straw under a lantern which hung from a beam. He was 12 years old and had lately grown rather stout, but he was still a majestic-looking pig with a wise and benevolent appearance, in spite of the fact that his tushes had never been cut. I'm highlighting in pink words that I think many of you may not know, and we'll just go over what they are, and I really encourage my students to keep a list of these words with definitions so that they can just go over them and make sure that, that they get some of that learning, that new vocabulary. So ensconce means to establish or settle in a comfortable, safe or secret place. Okay, so he's ensconced on his bed of straw. He's settled there, ready to go. There are a couple of other words there worth picking out. One of them is benevolent, means serving a charitable rather than profit-making purpose. So he's a, he's a good guy, this pig. He's there to help people. And tushes are, interestingly, 
a long pointed tooth, in particular a canine tooth of a male horse, but also obviously on a on a pig. So his his big pig teeth we're talking about talking about here. Before long, the other animals began to arrive and make themselves comfortable after their different fashions. First came the three dogs, Bluebell, Jesse, and Pincher, and then the pigs, who settled down in the straw immediately in front of the platform. The hens perched themselves on the window sills, the pigeons fluttered up to the rafters, the sheep and cows lay down behind the pigs and began to chew the cud. So basically the cud is, animals that chew the cud are like cows, and they are the animals that chew regurgitated food, like they, they chew food and then they kind of spit it up and they chew it again. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came together, walking slowly and setting down their vast hairy hoofs with great care, lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Clover was a stout motherly mare approaching middle life who had never quite got her figure back after her fourth foal. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly 18 hands high, and as strong as any two ordinary horses put together. A white stripe down his nose gave him a somewhat stupid appearance, and in fact he was not of first-rate intelligence, but he was universally respected for his steadiness of character and tremendous powers of work. Okay, some of these highlighted things here. I think one is that Clover and Boxer, I think, are meant to be like huge Clyde-style horses, workhorses that but they are taking care of the other animals there so they have that side to them which is um, protective also clover being the female and this novel and being written at this particular time femininity is very closely associated with motherly qualities and clover is like the the motherly woman boxer is the noble strong man and i think that together they are meant to represent the noble working classes the working the honest hard-working people um, of england germany russia whatever country so they represent the workers these two characters the male and female workers after the horses came muriel the white goat and benjamin the donkey benjamin was the oldest animal on the farm and the worst tempered he seldom talked and when he did it was usually to make some cynical remark for instance, he would say that God had given him a tail to keep the flies off, but that he would sooner have no tail and no flies. Alone among the animals on the farm, he never laughed. If asked why, he would say that he saw nothing to laugh at. Nevertheless, without openly admitting it, he was devoted to Boxer. The two of them usually spent their Sundays together in the small paddock beyond the orchard, grazing side by side, and never speaking. For many people, Benjamin is one of their favourite characters. He's, he's the one who kind of understands what's going on the quickest, and his cynicism helps him to kind of see through what the pigs get up to. And I wonder if Benjamin meant to represent people like George Orwell and society who are cynical and don't just swallow what they're being fed by other people, especially because it says that he's devoted to Boxer, as George Orwell himself was devoted to the working people and, and never lost his desire for working people to have better lives and a better society and, and those kind of socialist ideals. He never lost that, despite the fact that he became entirely disillusioned with the system. The two horses had just laid down when a brood of ducklings, which had lost their mother, filed into the barn cheeping feebly and wandering from side to side to find some place where they would not be trodden on. Clover made a sort of wall around them with her great foreleg and the ducklings nestled down inside it and promptly fell asleep. At the last moment, Molly, the foolish pretty white mare who drew Mr Jones's trap, came mincing daintily in, chewing at a lump of sugar. She took a place near the front and began flirting her white mane hoping to draw attention to the red ribbons it was plaited with. Molly here could be part of the working class. She is a horse, just like Boxer and Clover are, but she's been kind of sucked into the world of the ruling classes. So she's like their personal attendant. You imagine a butler or some, you know, or somebody along those lines, a maid in a manor house, and how they're, they're not really in, in dust, part of the industrial working class, even though they work 
they're very closely associated with the rich and their minds are kind of uh, very much focused on pleasing the rich. And here we've got you know words like foolish, pretty, flirting, and also mincing daintily. Now this word mincing is a very uh, interesting word. It says of a man affected dainty in manners or gait. Quite a controversial word because it's also often used with gay men to kind of depict that sort of camp uh, way of being. It's also used with sometimes with women who are Oh, you know, it's an overdoing of, of that sort of daintiness in a kind of way that isn't, is, is just overdone. So Molly is kind of representing those working people who become very entwined with their rulers and structure their kind of way of being around pleasing them and obtaining minor rewards and favours from them for, for doing their bidding. Okay. All right, so moving on to the last of all came the cat who looked round, as usual, for the warmest place and finally squeezed herself in between Boxer and Clover. There she purred contentedly throughout Major's speech without listening to a word of what he was saying. The cat is also is an animal like all of the others, so part of potentially the working people, but I think the cat never really fits in with the project and is always really a bit out for herself and is willing to prey on other animals in the system but also to kind of get involved in doing you know what what's necessary really to survive will go along with the pigs and so forth but will also try to get take advantage of the other animals when it suits her to me she represents what uh, marxists have often called the lumpen proletariat and this is a class of people such as criminals or you know, people who could be of the working class but who haven't you know they're not part of the working working class they have, they're living slightly outside of it and sometimes they are preying upon it in one way or another such as you know criminals might and they can also be join in with the workers and support them but they can also at times be used by rulers who might pay them off and get them to do sneaky, underhanded, kind of sometimes violent things to support the rulers. So they're not really entirely with the workers. And also here you can see she's, she's not listening to a word of what Major's saying. So she's not ideologically being convinced by what he's saying but uh, we'll find comfort in the revolution or with, with the other animals. All the animals were now present except Moses, the tame raven, who slept on a perch behind the back door. When Major saw that they had all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and be began. So Moses is another important character. Moses the tame raven, so that idea of being tame is again like Molly. The, the raven Moses is kind of in the pocket of Jones, the ruling class, and sleeping on the on a perch behind the back door is another kind of phrase that says he's not with the workers, he's separate to, and he's tame, meaning he's in the pocket of the, the ruling class. Moses represents religion and Orwell's idea, Marxist idea, that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, opiate meaning a drug, and that uh, the idea of Marxism is that religion will tame the working classes. And so the religious leaders really are doing the work of the rulers, giving the workers something to kind of look to, to um, make them feel better about their lives. When Major saw that they'd all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and began. Comrades, you have heard already about the strange dream that I had last night, but I will come to the dream later. I have something else to say first. I do not think, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months longer, and before I die, I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. I have had a long life, I have had much time for thought as I lay alone in my stall, and I think I may say that I understand the nature of life on this earth 
as well as any animal now living. It is about this that I wish to speak to you. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it, our lives are miserable, laborious and short. Now this phrase here, miserable and laborious and short, is really reminiscent of a famous phrase that comes originally from a philosopher, English philosopher called Hobbes, that the lives of human beings are nasty, brutal and short. And I'll, I'll just keep reading for a second. We are born, we are given just so much food as will keep the breath in our bodies. And those of us who are capable of it are forced to work to the last atom of our strength. And the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered with hideous cruelty. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. That is the plain truth. Now Hobbes was writing his philosophy several hundred years before Karl Marx and his idea was that society needed a leader at the top like a king who had power and could punish others in order to organise that society and bring that society out of this kind of barbaric lifestyle where people were just stealing and slaughtering each other in order to to survive. Hobbes's idea was that human beings were fundamentally selfish creatures that would just perpetually you know, be stealing, slaughtering and subsequently leading these horrific lives. Now, several hundred years later, we had, had societies that were organised around leaders that uh, wielded power and organised people and had laws that were meant to keep people safe. But several hundred years Later, Karl Marx was saying, but actually the lives of working people are still nasty, brutish and short. They are still horrible. The workers are exploited. They do all of the work within society. They are paid uh, only enough money to allow them to survive their working lives and to perhaps raise a few children who themselves will go on to be workers and all of the uh, labor that they expend working for the, the capitalist class is taken from them and used to profit the rich. At the time that uh, Karl Marx was writing that was probably a fairly accurate description of what working class life was like. It was quite horrific, you know, probably quite Accurate. There wasn't much in the way of leisure time and there wasn't much left over after wages. So, so I'll go on. But is this simply part of the order of nature? Is it because this land of ours is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell upon it? No, comrades. A thousand times no. The soil of England is fertile. Its climate is good. It is capable of affording food in abundance to an enormously greater number of animals than now inhabit it. This single farm of ours would support a dozen horses, 20 cows, hundreds of sheep, and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue in this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of the produce of our labour is stolen from us by human beings. Their comrades is the answer to all our problems. It is summed up in a single word, man. Man is the only real enemy we have. Remove man from the scene and the root of hunger and overwork is abolished forever. And there you, there, and there you have, in a nutshell, Marxism, the idea of Marxism. Man here is the capitalist class, the owners of what was called the means of production. This is the factories and, and the, uh, the, the land where all the food is grown and all of that sort of stuff. The capitalist class and the animals represent those who, who work it, who do all of the work. And the, the idea of, of abundance is, is that if, if that means of production, the factories, the land, etc., were properly managed, we could have a lot more production and a lot more wealth within society, but it's mismanaged. And also what profits there are are taken by the capitalist class uh, for their own use and, uh, and not, not used in, in a, a way that benefits all. 
So we go on. Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. And this is another Marxist idea. Marxists say that the capitalists don't create wealth. They only own the means of production and the workers create the wealth. That's one of the ideas of Marxism. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow. He cannot run fast enough to catch rabbits, yet he is lord of all the animals. He sets them to work. He gives back to them the bare minimum that will prevent them from starving and the rest he keeps for himself. Our labour tills the soil. Our dung fertilises it. And yet, and yet there is not one of us that owns more than his bare skin. You cows that I see before me, how many thousands of gallons of milk have you given during this last year? And what has happened to that milk, which should have been breeding up sturdy calves? Every drop of it, drop of it has gone down the throats of our enemies. And you hens, how many eggs have you laid in this last year? And how many of those eggs ever hatched into chickens? The rest have all gone to market to bring in money for Jones and his men. And you, Clover, where are those four foals you bore who should have been the support and pleasure of your old age? Each was sold at a year old. You will never see one of them again. In return for, for your four confinements and all your labour in the fields, what have you ever had except your bare rations and a store? Confinements means having, having babies, you know, giving birth. The condition of being in childbirth, there you go. And even the miserable lives we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. For myself, I do not grumble, for I am one of the lucky ones. I am 12 years old and have had over 400 children, such as the natural life of a pig. But no animal escapes the cruel knife in the end. You young porkers who are sitting in front of me, every one of you will scream your lives out at the block within a year. To that horror, we all must come. Pigs, cows, hens, sheep, everyone. Even the horses and the dogs have no better fate. You, Boxer, the very day that those great muscles of yours lose their power, Jones will sell you to the knacker. He will cut your throat he will bore you down for the foxhounds. It means he's going to be turned into dog meat. As for the dogs, when they grow old and toothless, Jones ties a brick around their necks and drowns them in the nearest pond. So this block here, back here, that's the pigs being slaughtered for food, basically. Is it not crystal clear then, comrades, that all the evils of this life of ours spring from the tyranny of human beings? Only get rid of man and the produce of our labour would be our own. Almost overnight we could become rich and free. What then must we do? Ought why work night and day, body and soul, for the overthrow of the human race? That is my message to you, comrades. Rebellion! I do not know when that rebellion will come. And here, I'm just going to highlight comrades because the use of the word comrades is another connection to Marxism, socialism, communism. Comrades is a term that's used, traditionally used to address someone who you united with, you know, as a Marxist or as a socialist. I do not know when that rebellion will come. It might be in a week or a hundred years, but I know as surely as I see this straw beneath my feet that sooner or later justice will be done. Fix your eyes on that, comrades, throughout the short remainder of your lives, and above all, pass on this message of mine to those who come after you so that future generations shall carry on the struggle until it is victorious. And remember, comrades, your resolution must never falter. No argument must lead you astray. Never listen when they tell you that man and the animals have a common interest, that the prosperity of the one is the prosperity of the others. It is all lies. Man serves the interests of no creature except himself. And among us animals, let there be perfect unity, perfect comradeship in the struggle. All men are enemies. All animals are comrades. At this moment, there was a tremendous uproar. While Major was speaking, four large rats had crept out of their holes and were sitting on their hind quarters listening to him. The dogs had suddenly caught sight of them, and it was only by a swift dash for their holes that the rats saved their lives. Major raised his trotter for silence. Comrades, he said, 
Here is a point that must be settled. The wild creatures such as the rats and rabbits, are they our friends or our enemies? Let us put it to the vote. I propose this question to the meeting. Are rats comrades? The vote was taken at once and it was agreed by an overwhelming majority that rats were comrades. There were only four dissents dissentients, in opposition to a majority or official opinion. The three dogs and the cat, who was afterwards discovered to have voted on both sides. So everything in that idea of the cat being fickle and not really, really wedded to one opinion. And both the dogs and the cats are the natural predators of, of these wild animals. So that would be why they might be wanting to um, continue to prey upon them. I have little more to say. I merely repeat, remember always your duty of enmity towards man and all his ways. So this is a vocab word for us. The state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. So very simple. Man, enemy. All the animals, friends. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when you have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes or drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or touch money or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. Weak or strong, clever or simple, we are all brothers. No animal must ever kill any other animal. All animals are equal. So this is the vision. The vision is all animals uh, to join together and uh, unite and um, be equal with each other and not follow man in his ways. And not now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. I cannot describe that dream to you. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished. But it reminded me of something that I had long forgotten. Many years ago, when I was a little pig, my mother and the other sows used to sing an old song of which they knew only the tune and the first three words. I had known that tune in my infancy, but it had long since passed out of my mind. Last night, however, it came back to me in my dream. And what is more, the words of the song also came back, words I am certain which were sung by the animals of long ago and have been lost to memory for generations. I will sing you that song now, comrades. I am old and my voice is hoarse, but when I have taught you the tune, you can sing it better for yourselves. It is called Beasts of England. Old Major cleared his throat and began to sing. As he had said, his voice was hoarse, but he sang well enough and it was a stirring tune, something between Clementine and La Chucharacha. And we're going to get on to the words of it first, but uh, those two songs, Clementine, I think he means, Oh, my darling, Clementine. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling, Clementine. And the La Chucharacha is a Mexican song. Uh, la Chucharacha, La Chucharacha. I'll give you a little clip of that. Here it comes. Caracha, la chucaracha. Okay, so I'll just read the words of the song. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of... Should I sing it? Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime. Hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late... The day is coming, tyrant man shall be overthrown, and the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Ring shall vanish from our noses, and the harness from our back. Bit and spur shall rust forever, cruel whips no more shall crack. Rich is more than mine can picture. Wheat and barley, oats and hay. 
Clover beans and mango wurzels shall be ours upon that day. Bright will shine the fields of England, purer shall its waters be. Sweeter yet shall blow its breezes on the day that sets us free. For that day we all must labor, though we die before it break. Cows and horses, geese and turkeys, all must toil for freedom's sake. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime, hearken well and spread my tidings of the golden future time. All right, that was fun. I quite enjoyed that. I sometimes sing in class, uh, so I have had a little bit of practice. So a couple of things I highlighted there are the fruitful fields of England. That harkens back to that idea that they can be living in abundance and plenty. There's nothing intrinsically about the land that they're working on that means they need to live in poverty. It could be really, they could all live in wealth. And this relates to the Marxist idea that human beings become alienated or separated from what they actually produce in their work through the capitalist system. It's called Marxist theory of alienation. And it's really about the way that, that workers lose control of the product of their own labor. There is abundance produced, wealth is produced through human labor or in the case of animal farm, animal labor but that those who do the work, who are creative and produce things, don't get to control any of it. And there's all sorts of effects that are meant to stem from that, particularly that they're being ripped off and exploited and not getting the benefit of that wealth and abundance, but also a, sort of a, an emotional or a psychological effect of not being able to express themselves fully and um, completely through work. I've got here, bit and spur shall rust forever. So the bit is what you put in a horse's mouth and a spur is is to kick the horse along. So the idea is restraining them through the bit and controlling them and hurting them. Cruel whips, the same idea, the idea of controlling and hurting them. You have whips, harnesses, nose rings and bits. Now all of these items are things that human beings use to control animals and get animals to do what they want them to do. If you think about each one of them, they're not like tools. Tools are things that help a person complete a piece of work. These are all things that are used to control the animal and get the animal to work. And so if you swing it around and you say that the animals are now going to work the farm for themselves, for their own benefit, then none of these items, which are all symbolic of and actually part of the controlling of them, the ripping off of their labor by human beings, none of those items will be required going forward. Oh, this wurzel thing. I'll show you a picture of a mangle wurzel. Okay, and what else? Um, also, uh, just, you know, that we're going to to toil for freedom's sake. So this is, this is all about revolution for freedom and the idea that they can create a better world, a golden future time. What they're going to be setting out to achieve is meant to make their lives better. The singing of this song threw the animals into the wildest excitement. Almost before Major had reached the end, they had begun singing it for themselves. Even the stupidest of them had already picked up the tune and a few of the words, and as for the clever ones, such as the pigs and the dogs, they had the entire song by heart within a few minutes. And then after a few preliminary tries, the whole farm burst out into Beasts of England in a tremendous unison. The cows lowed it. The dogs whined it, and the sheep bleated it. The horses whinnied it. The ducks quacked it. They were so delighted with the song that they sang it right through five times in succession and might have continued singing it all night if they had not been interrupted. And I've got a little clip here of a cartoon version of the animals singing it um, in their own kind of animal noises. <laughs>
There you go, that'll be enough of that. Unfortunately, the uproar awoke Mr. Jones, who sprang out of bed, making sure that there was a fox in the yard. He seized a gun, which always stood in a corner of his bedroom, and let fly a charge of number six shot into the darkness. The pellets buried themselves in the wall of the barn, and the meeting broke up hurriedly. Everyone fled to his own sleeping place. The birds jumped on their perches, the animals settled down in the straw, and the whole farm was asleep in a moment. And that is the end of the chapter. So I'll stop there for now, and if you like and subscribe, you'll see that I've got other videos coming up that should interest you, and I'll continue to read the novel. So like and subscribe to Dr. English. Hope you've enjoyed the reading of this chapter, and my singing. So see you next time.